Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're taking a look today at the Azul Byte 4. This is an Intel Gemini Lake powered mini PC, something we've looked at quite a bit in the past. But there's some cool stuff about this one that I think set it apart. The first, of course, is that it is completely silent and fanless. It's got a lot of expandability, a lot of ports as you can see, and one of the Ethernet ports here can actually power the entire computer. So if you were running this as a headless server or something, all you would need to do is plug it into your PoE switch, and that would be all you need to get up and running with it. A really cool concept. We're going to explore what this little mini PC is all about in just a second, but I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this came in free of charge from Azul. However, all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this little computer is all about. Now, the price point on this one is $249. It costs pretty much the same as other similarly equipped mini PCs that are out there. Now, this is powered by an Intel Gemini Lake processor, a J4125. It has four gigabytes of RAM and 64 gigabytes of storage. And I'm gonna take it apart in a minute so you can see what you can upgrade inside of it. I would have preferred that they included eight gigabytes of RAM versus the four. And the reason is, is that these computers like to be run in dual channel memory configuration to get the best graphics performance. It's an easy fix. You can open it up and just put in another four gigabyte DDR4 module. Uh, but that is something I would recommend doing because without that second module, you're not going to get the full potential of what this machine is capable of doing. Now, the machine is fanless, as I mentioned. You're gonna to wanna to keep the left-hand side of it clear for airflow. The top portion of the case here is a big metal heat sink. So the entire top of this computer is its cooling system. So you definitely don't wanna put anything down on top of it either. It's going to get warm to the touch when you're in operation. That is nothing to be alarmed about. And as you'll see a little later in the video, uh, the cooling on this is actually very effective, much more than I thought it would be. Uh, so altogether, a pretty nice little uh, design from the hardware standpoint. On the front here, you've got an IR receiver. If you wanted to use a remote control for some home theater capabilities, just note that these are not great for home theater because it doesn't support HDR when you're in 4K video modes. On the back here, we've got our Wi-Fi antennas. It supports uh, wireless AC, not Wi-Fi 6. You do have a power port here for its adapter. It takes a 12 volt, two amp adapter, but you can also plug in your ethernet cable if it's plugged into a PoE switch and power it over ethernet, as I mentioned, which we're going to do in a minute. Now, if you don't have a PoE switch, this will default to being just a regular network adapter. Uh, so you have two of these on here. Both of them are gigabit and they are powered by Realtek chipsets. Uh, in the middle here, you've got a display port output. This will do 4K at 60 frames per second max. You also have an HDMI output that will also do 4K at 60 frames per second. You have a VGA output here as well, along with a headphone jack. And then there's a Kensington lock here on the bottom of the package. On the side, you have some more stuff, including an SD card reader built right in. That's a micro SD card reader. You have four USB 3 ports and then a USB type C port. Unfortunately, this USB-C port is only for data devices. It doesn't support display output, nor does it support power delivery. So the only way to power this are via the uh, DC plug there or uh, with the PoE if you wanna go in that direction. Let me pop the lid on this now and let's see what's inside. Now it's pretty easy to get into this. You just have to unscrew the rubber feet on the bottom. You can do that with your hands. Then there are two screws on the back that you have to loosen up and then the bottom of the case here will come off. And if you look inside, you'll see that it's actually pretty nicely laid out. Uh, you do have your RAM modules here. I did add this second module to get the best performance out of this for the review. Again, when you buy this with the four gig configuration, you're only going to have one of those two slots occupied. You definitely want to get another stick of RAM in there. Uh, this here is the PoE power supply, and that is tied in with this uh, ethernet connector right here. And then you'll notice also there's a SATA cable here in the case, just kind of disconnected at the moment. Uh, but if you wanted to, you can mount a SATA drive on the uh, back of the casing here and plug it into the SATA port that is right over here. It's kind of hard to see. 
uh, but you got the SATA port right there for a traditional two and a half inch drive. I think they said it'll support up to two terabytes, so you could get an inexpensive solid state drive or something to pop in there. And then it also has an NVMe slot here. It's a PCI Express 2X slot, and you can put in a uh, NVMe drive if you wanted to go that route. So you could have three different storage devices, the built-in 64 gigabyte eMMC, you've got your SATA option, and then you've got the NVMe that you can put in as well. So expandable memory, lots of expandable storage, and that is a pretty good thing. Let's put it back together here and continue on. Now this is Visa mountable, so if you wanted to mount this on the back of a monitor or display, you can do that but the mount does not come with the package here. You've got to buy it separately, so just keep that in mind. And now what I want to do is get this thing powered on so we can see how it works. So let me get out my Ethernet cable and get this thing going. All right, let's try this out now. I've got an Ethernet cable here attached to my PoE switch in my equipment room, and all I'm going to do is just plug it into the PoE Ethernet port here. And what's going to happen in just a second is you'll see the light light up here to indicate that we're powered and if I push the button to turn on the computer it will boot up. Now I've got it attached to this monitor here. This is a 4K 60 Hertz monitor. I've got it going from the display port output into the monitor here and as you can see with just that Ethernet cable attached powering it we are now booting up the computer and jumping into things. All right, I'm gonna jump ahead here a little bit because I logged into Windows and then booted up a benchmark that really stresses out the processor. So right now we're running at full blast here, pretty much 99, 100% uh, at close to the full two gigahertz speed. It hasn't throttled down any lower than what you see it's doing right now. So the thermals on this I think are very good and we'll take a look at a benchmark that will measure that a little bit more closely in a few minutes. The computer is getting a little warm to the touch, but again, that's part of its design, so no issues there. Uh, now, as this test is going, I've also got my control panel up on my Mac here uh, from my power over Ethernet switch. And as you can see here, the computer is currently drawing about 13 watts, give or take, uh, from that PoE switch. Now, a little bit earlier, I ran another benchmark and I had an external hard drive attached and I was noticing that the system here was drawing about 21 watts and change from the PoE switch in the closet over there. So the power needs of this device are going to vary greatly depending on what you're doing with it. And that's not unusual for a computer. They only use the power that they need. But when you have it attached to a network switch, you do have to factor in how much power is available on that switch for all of the devices that are plugged into it that are also drawing power. They call that the power budget. Now the switch that I have has a power budget of 42 watts and right now I've got two devices drawing power over Ethernet. I've got my wireless access point here that's doing about four watts and now I've got the computer here plugged in uh, which is running at idle now uh, and it's drawing about 4.8 watts on its own. But if it goes up to 20, uh, that's going to certainly impact what else I can power on that switch. So you're definitely going to want to leave yourself a buffer if you do intend to have an Ethernet switch power the computer. And there's a lot of good reasons to maybe have a computer powered over Ethernet. Uh, one is that if you wanted to put it someplace where you don't have electrical power, you can just run some low voltage Ethernet cable and you're good to go, right? It's pretty convenient. I could see areas where you've got digital signage or even, like I said at the outset here, kind of a headless server running in the server room. There's a lot of cool things that you can do when you've got that flexibility for power but you just have to make sure that you budget the power appropriately so you don't blow out anything or lose power to a device that's really important to your infrastructure. Now, as many of you know, I've got multi-gigabit internet here at the house, so we're able to now uh, do speed tests over the internet versus just on the internal LAN. And as you can see here, we're getting gigabit speeds out of that ethernet port, even though that is the port that's currently powering the computer. Uh, let's take a look now at some web browsing. Again, we're running at 4K 60 hertz, and I've got the display scaled at 200%. And it's actually pretty snappy and responsive, although it does feel a bit faster at 1080p 60 versus the 4K 60 we're at right now. Uh, but as you can see, it is performing pretty nicely. But if you are getting used to some of these newer, higher-end Intel and AMD devices, it's going to feel a little more sluggish at this higher resolution, but still it's performing, I think, quite well, uh, considering that it is a pretty low-powered computer. And on the browserbench.org speedometer test, we got a score of 50.1. 
That puts it right in line with another Gemini Lake J4125 we looked at recently called the GMK Knuckbox, a little tiny mini PC, and it was within the margin of error of that one. Uh, a few weeks ago, we also looked at the Azul Access 4. It's pretty close to that one. That is a stick PC, and that chip was running a little slower than the one in the bite here. And altogether, I think it's going to be a very good performer for doing the basics like video watching, web browsing, and that sort of thing. Now, a little bit earlier, we tested out some 4K 60 frames per second video on YouTube. It did drop some frames initially when the page was first rendering in, but once that settled down, it was able to maintain a constant frame rate without dropping any further frames. So if you are watching 4K video on this, it should do fine. It might be a little jumpy initially, but then it'll smooth out as time goes on. But again, I think 1080p is probably the sweet spot for this particular device. All right, let's take a look at some games now. We've got Rocket League running here, 1080p lowest settings. Not spectacular, about 20 to 25 frames per second. That's usually what we see on one of these devices. If you only had one stick of RAM installed, this would not be performing as well as what you're seeing here. But I think for Rocket League, the sweet spot will be 720p, and you'll probably get in the high 30s to mid 40s, uh, depending on what's going on on screen. Uh, older games, though, run really well on it. This is Half-Life 2 running at 1080p, and here we're getting about 60 to 70 frames per second, so that's pretty good for the older stuff. And there's a lot of older stuff out there now on Steam that will run nicely on here. Uh, we also checked out Shovel Knight, kind of a retro-inspired game. And here we were running at a constant 60 frames per second at 1080p. So there are a lot of games that I think will run quite well on this. We've seen the GameCube emulator actually do pretty well uh, running on this hardware too. So I think you've got a good amount of entertainment here, just not any of the current AAA titles will run very well. But it does do a very good job with game streaming. So this is GeForce Now uh, running Wreckfest, one of my favorite racing games at the moment. And this is running just fine streaming from the GeForce Now servers. So if you are into game streaming, uh, this is a great platform for that. It does a very nice job streaming video, and game streaming isn't all that much different. And on the 3D Mark CloudGate benchmark test, we got a score of 3,821. That puts this machine right where I expected it to land in performance. And you can see how it does against that GMK Knuckbox with the same processor. Uh, so all in a nicely performing machine that doesn't make any noise at all and actually keeps itself quite cool. And we ran the 3D Mark stress test, which runs one of these benchmarks over and over again to see if there's any variation in performance. And there we got a surprisingly good score of 99.5%. So this thing is really quite effective at passively cooling itself and maintaining consistent performance. You're probably not gonna see that much throttling at all on this unless you cover up the vents or put something on top of it. I think if you've got it sitting on the desk like I have it sitting right now, it's going to be a very consistent performer. And that was very surprising given our experience with other fanless PCs running with these same chips. And we found that Linux runs very nicely on the device. We booted up Ubuntu 20.10. Video, audio, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, everything got detected properly. It really was a pretty seamless experience once we got booted up. Uh, so if you do have Linux projects, this will be a fun one to use with those, and it performs pretty nicely too. I did, though, have to make one change in the BIOS to get Linux to boot. So if you go over to the chipset section here and go to Useful Function, uh, you have to change the OS selection from Windows to Intel Linux. And once you make that change, it'll boot right up. But before that, it wouldn't. Uh, the good news is, is that once you make this setting change, Windows will continue to boot up without issue. And so that's the only thing you got to do to get uh, the Linux stuff going on this one. The BIOS is protected with a password, but the password is four zeros to get into it. I think they just want to make sure that people don't accidentally stumble into it because you can mess it up, especially when you've got a fanless computer here by tweaking the wrong BIOS setting. But if you go in and just make that one change, uh, you're good to go on Linux. And again, we found the compatibility to be pretty nice on here. So in conclusion, I think this is a really neat little mini PC. You've got a lot of creative deployment options given that it is just powered by the ethernet cable. I might try to install PFSense on this and have it work as a PFSense router. I know a lot of you prefer to have Intel chipsets for that sort of thing, but we can just power it with the ethernet. And we've got two gigabit ethernet adapters built right in, so that's pretty handy. Uh, you could run this as a Plex server. 
because it does support Intel QuickSync, so it can do hardware transcoding for uh, media serving purposes. In full disclosure, Plex is an occasional sponsor here on the channel, but it's the media server that I use here in the house. And again, you could just have this plugged in as a headless media server with nothing but the Ethernet cable to power it. So that's another neat thing you could do. I love the storage expandability on this. You've got SATA and the NVMe option along with the onboard uh, eMMC. I do wish, though, that they gave you uh, 8 gigs of RAM in the box versus 4. So again, definitely get that extra RAM module. And my only real knock here against it is that the USB-C port here is not a full featured port. I would have loved if you could have used the USB-C port as your source of power instead because you could plug it into a docking station or something like that. Uh, but beyond that, I think it's a really nice little computer that I think a lot of you looking for a project computer will really get a lot of value and use out of. Just make sure you upgrade that RAM there. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, Tom Albrecht, Mark Bollinger, Sergio Morales, Mark Dell, Jim Callagher, and Stephen Sue. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. Don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.